Dark out on the ocean, the wind and waves are blowing. The terrified disciples thought surely they would drown. In the fourth watch of the morning, they saw Jesus walking towards them, speaking words of comfort. Take courage, it is I. Walk on water. 
as you and I We get caught up in the storms Because our circumstances Make it hard for us to see We must put on our faith in Jesus And reach out for His hand And He will come and save us If only we I got a message today that I'm excited about, but sometimes what the preacher gets excited about is boring to everybody else. <laughs> so that's uh, that's something we'll do our best to. Uh... Someone came in church this morning and said that they were a little under the weather; or they weren't <clears throat> exactly up to speed and. So I'd have to be particularly dynamic to keep him awake. I said, have you ever tried to preach to a bunch of sleepy senior citizens? You know, talk about a challenge. Uh, but we're going to do our best to be overcomers today. Uh, I've been doing a little preaching out of the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament as much as the New Testament. Uh, and I'll tell you why. The Old Testament creates all kinds of pictures and shadows and mirrors of things to come. And most people miss it. They just read the story and that's it. You know, well, it's an interesting story. And, and so it's just a little segment of history, not realizing that this book is so woven intricately together that it just demonstrates Grand truths and principles over and over and over again. This is one of those occasions. Uh, go to Second Samuel, if you would. Second uh, Samuel in your Bibles. Second Samuel chapter nineteen and verse ten. Second Samuel nineteen ten. And Absalom, whom we anointed over us is dead in battle. Now therefore, why speak ye not a word of bringing the king back? Let's pray. Father, I trust that today you would grant us a supernatural wisdom as directed by your Holy Spirit to pursue the scriptures that are in front of us with all the authority of the Word of God. Lord, we find no authority in ourselves. We find no particular reason to pursue these things because of human instincts. But rather, Lord, because of divine instruction and direction. And so I pray that today we'll get something from these these verses and these chapters that will have very significant meaning to every person here. And I should thank you for it. In the name of our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 
All right, let's rewind and get the story. King David was dealing with a rebellion. And the rebellion was initiated by one in his own family, as a matter of fact, his own son, his son Absalom. And Absalom <clears throat> had generated a, a number of people that were loyal and faithful to him. And Absalom finally determined that it was his time to make a move. And so he gathered his followers and uh, initiated this great rebellion against his own father, the king, King David. And uh, when the word came out that uh, Absalom had amassed a considerable army, David and his counselors decided that it was time for David to at least temporarily make a run for it. They left Jerusalem, not only for their own protection, but for the protection of the population of Jerusalem itself. They left. And uh, uh, <clears throat> due process of time, uh, David's men, under the leadership of his five-star general Joab, met the forces of Absalom. And Absalom's army was defeated, and Absalom himself was killed. And so, <clears throat> after in the aftermath of all this, uh, some of the priestly bunch, some of the hierarchy, particularly in the religious efforts, said, well, why isn't anybody talking about bringing the king back? Now, what's being created here is a picture of a much larger scenario. He came into his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. The Jewish people corporately, now there were individual exceptions to be sure, but corporately rejected their coming king, Jesus Christ. Was not his kingship announced at his birth by the angels? Did not even the priest and the scribes assent to the fact that one day they awaited a Messiah king? And yet as he pursued his ministry, his ministry of healing and caring and compassion and ultimately dying on the cross to provide salvation for every sinner, <clears throat> he was rejected. And so Jesus fled. He went away. Where'd he go? Well, he went to heaven. But <clears throat> someday someone's going to say, why don't we bring the king back? How about that? That's a notion. That's an idea. Well, <clears throat> what this message has to do with, we're going to examine five different individuals within the framework of this story. And in those individuals, we're going to see five attitudes about the return of the king. Not everyone's excited about the king returning. I mean, really. When you stop and think about it, and you read the book of Revelation, and you understand what God has to say about how the king is going to rule when he returns, not everyone's thrilled about that. That Bible says he's going to rule with a rod of iron. In other words, his word will be final. There'll be no appeal to another supreme court. He will be the supreme court. He will be the legislator. He will be the president, prime minister. He will be the king. And he will rule with absolute dictatorial authority. Now, for those of us that love him and love his word and love his legislative dictates, we're going to say, man, that'll be great. Won't that be wonderful? You know, we won't deal with all the hypocrisy that we deal with today. I heard uh, some of the pundits on liberal television speaking in horror about some of President Trump's language. Oh, 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 oh. why well, he said words that cannot be repeated in mixed company. Now, I'm not defending what he said, but I thought that is the biggest pile of baloney I've ever heard. 
because it's that very group, the left, the liberals, that have introduced the, all of the evil language on television and in the movies and everything else. And now all of a sudden they're terrified. Oh, that's just terrible. Hypocrites, hypocrites, hypocrites. Jesus will deal with the hypocrites. Uh, he dealt with them rather harshly in Matthew chapter 23 in his first ministry. What, and that was a ministry of love and compassion. What do you think he's going to de- How is he going to deal with them the next time around when he returns? So not everyone is going to be excited. Do you think that all the Hollywood producers, do you think that Harvey Weinstein will be excited <laughs> when the king returns? I mean, really, <clears throat> do you think that most of the folks in Congress will just stand up and shout and applaud? Probably not. Do you think the Supreme Court will say, yay, the king is finally here. Our job is done. Probably not. Do you think that all the drug dealers in Walsenburg, the illegal ones, <laughs> will be excited about the return of the king? How about all those that profit by pornography and the exploitation of children? Do you think that crowd will be? No, there'll be a lot of people that won't be excited. But some will when the king returns. And what we're going to see in examining five individuals that are all enframed in this tremendous story that actually take several chapters, so we can't read the whole thing. We're just going to have to kind of cherry-pick things out of it today. But uh, we're going to see five different attitudes about the return of the king. Now, if you're a Bible believer, if you're saved, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, I can't help but believe that you're going to be one of those who are going to be cheering for the return of the king. Uh, Bill Gaither years ago wrote a song about the king is coming. The king is coming. It's become a very popular song. Particularly with believers. Why? Why shouldn't we be excited about the return of the king? So, <clears throat> the king. Well, the priests, the religion, that bunch, are the last to recognize the great need to bring the king back. Well, that matches with a verse I already quoted to you. He came into his own, and his own received him not. We'll go back to, uh, or forward, excuse me, in chapter 19 to verse 13. And say ye to Amasa, now this is personality number one, Amasa. Art thou not of my bone and of my flesh? God do so to me, and more also, if thou be not captain of the host, before me continually in the room of Joab. Now that's just kind of poetic language to say, I'll tell you what, Amasa, I'll make you second in charge to Joab, the five-star general. And he bowed the heart of all the men of Judah, even as the heart of one man, so that they sent this word unto the king, return thou and all thy servants. So the king returned and came to Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal to go to meet the king, to conduct the king over Israel. Well, now, who is this Amasa dude anyway? Well, we need to find out. Go back to chapter 17. Chapter 17, verse 25. And Absalom made Amasa captain of the host instead of Joab, which Amasa was a man's son, whose name was Ithra, an Israelite, that went into Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister to Zariah, Joab's mother. Now, wait a minute. Absalom, the rebeller. Absalom. A tremendous type of the Antichrist, as you study the scriptures. Absalom, the one who foments all this rebellion against the king, says to Amasa, how about if I make you general? And Amasa said, oh, that sounds good to me. Yeah, I kind of like that. You know, that, that sounds, that sounds excellent. I'll be in charge of all of the military operation that's about to ensue. Now, wait a minute. It's not but a little while later, and David says, I'll tell you what, Amasa. I'm willing to give you a position in the Pentagon after the rebellion is put down. He says that. You know what that is? That's a phenomenal picture of grace and mercy. 
tremendous picture of grace and mercy. Because you see, in reality, every human being has an element of rebellion in their heart. That's why the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. But Amasa, the problem is, Amasa, well, let's, let's back up for a minute. He, uh, he accepts the grace and mercy of David, but um, let's, uh, let's go over to uh, chapter 20, chapter 20 and verse 4. So mercy is extended to Amasa, just like mercy is extended to every sinner. 20 and verse 4, Then said the king to Amasa, Assemble me, the men of Judah, within three days, and be thou here present. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he tarried longer than the set time which he had appointed him. So Amasa has still got sabotage in his heart. He accepts the grace extended to him on the part of the king, but his heart is still looking after the desires of Absalom and the desires of Amasa. So he's still attempting a kind of sabotage under direct military orders from the chief, from the king. The king says, you do this in three days. But Amasa procrastinated. He delayed on purpose. So verse 6, David figures it out. And David said to Abishai, Now shall Sheba, the son of Bichri, do us more harm than did Absalom. Take thou the Lord's servants and pursue after him, lest he get him fenced cities and escape us. Well, Joab, uh, if you study the whole life and of Joab, you understand that he had his rascal moments too. But Joab's pretty loyal to David, and Joab doesn't take long to figure out that the general serving under him is a rat. You want excitement? You want intrigue? Read your Bible. I mean, it's better than Louis L'Amour. All right, let me show you what I'm talking about. Chapter 20, verse 8. So <clears throat> David sends his uh, Navy SEALs, his Rangers, and his Marines out on this mission. You read about it in verse 7. And verse 8. When they were at the great stone, which is in Gibeah, Massa went before them. And Joab's garment that he had put on was girded upon him, and upon it a girdle with a sword fastened unto his loins in the sheath thereof. And as he went forth, it fell out. And Joab said to Amasa, Art thou in health, my brother? Now Amasa was supposed to meet them within the three-day limit. He just conveniently disappeared. And so Joab and the troops are out looking for this other deadbeat, and they encounter Amasa. And Joab took Amasa by the beard with the right hand to kiss him. That's an oriental custom, you see. These guys aren't gay. Don't worry about it. But Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Joab's hand. So he smote him therewith in the fifth rib and shed out his bowels to the ground and struck him not again. And he died. I like the way the Lord puts some things. He died. Nothing else to it. He died. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued after Sheba, the son of Bichri. And one of Joab's men stood by him and said, He that favoreth Joab and he that is for David, let him go after Joab. And Amasa wallowed in blood in the midst of the highway. <clears throat> and when the man saw that all the people stood still, he removed Amasa out of the highway into the field and cast a cloth upon him when he saw that everyone that came by him stood still. When he was removed out of the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue after Sheba, the son of Bichri. Now, Joab said, I know that guy's a rat. I know it's not his heart is not with the king. And therefore, Joab took it upon himself, as he did in the case of Absalom. He said, I'm going to extinguish this guy. In the words of the mob, I'm going to rub him out. I'm going to whack him. 
And so he got whacked. That's the destiny of Amasa. You know what the problem is? The problem is Amasa's heart. Even though he professed at times allegiance to the king, his heart was never with the king. That's why the Bible says, Not if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The Bible has so much to say about the activity of the heart. Some people can go through all the religious motions of the world, but it's the heart that God examines. It's the heart that he inspects. It's not the outside, it's the inside. Let's look at uh, suspect number two. Go back to chapter 19. Chapter 19. All right. And, uh, well, no, let's, let, let's back up a little further. Let's go to chapter 16 and then we'll go to 19. Let's. So, at this point, David is fleeing Jerusalem and fleeing the wrath of the rebel Absalom. And in verse 5 of chapter 16, and when King David came to Baharim, Behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came forth and cursed still as he came. Now you remember the house of Saul. Of course, Saul was the first king over Israel. And when Saul abdicated from his kingly responsibility and his disciplined love for God, God said, I'll anoint another. And the one that he anointed was David, even though David was a very young man at the time. Well, Saul, of course, immediately identified the problem and sought the life of David for years. David fled, he ran, he hid, and so on and so forth. Well, <clears throat> this guy right here, Shimei, he's of the family of Saul. So he has some family loyalty here. And he cast stones at David and at the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on the right hand and on the left. So this guy, he's come out, <clears throat> David and his troop are fleeing, And this guy's out throwing rocks at David. Well, and thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial. Belial means the devil. And the Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Well, <clears throat> David was a man of war. No question about it, but he was pressed into those situations through no particular desire of his own, dating all the way back to Goliath and that whole story. Then said Abishai of the son of Zariah unto the king. Now Abishai is one of the loyal men under the command of David. Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. You kind of got to like Abishai. You know, you just do. You kind of like, you, you got to say, yeah, this guy, you know. He'd fit well in the Warfano Community Bible Church. You know, he'd probably do okay right here. <laughs> Verse 10. And the king said, what have I to do with you, ye son of Zariah? So let him curse. Because the Lord hath said unto him, curse David. Who shall then say, wherefore hast thou done so? And David said to Abishai and all his servants, Behold my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. So David, once again, exercising a phenomenal amount of grace and mercy, said, let him throw his rocks, let him curse, let him lie, let him slander. It's okay. It's okay. Just leave him alone. On we go. On we go. Well, all right, now let's go to chapter 19. By the time we get to chapter 19, the rebellion has been put down. Absalom is dead. And Joab is out hunting all of the adversaries, you see. Now, so, in chapter 19, when... uh, when uh, the uh, uh, <clears throat> the king is returning in verse 16. 
And Shimei, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, which was a Baharim, hasted and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. And there were a thousand men of Benjamin with him. And Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his 15 sons and his 20 servants with him. And uh, they went over Jordan before the king. And there went over a ferry boat to uh, carry over the king's household and to do what he thought good. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was come over Jordan. Now watch the change of attitude. Watch the change of attitude. And said unto the king, Let not my lord impute iniquity unto me, neither do thou remember that which thy servant did perversely that day that my lord the king went out of Jerusalem, that the king should take it to his heart. For thy servant doth know that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I am come the first day of all of the house of Joseph to go down to meet my lord the king. But Abishai, good old Abishai, the son of Zariah answered and said, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? <laughs> Abishai, he's still got a burr under his saddle. <laughs> he's saying, you know what? I'd still like to take this dude's head off. <laughs> now, all of a sudden, <clears throat> Shimei's attitude is 180 degrees opposite. Oh, forgive me. I've sinned. I cursed you. I shouldn't have done that. My, oh, my, oh, my. Well, if you read on in the narrative, David says, it's okay. It's all right. I forgive you. No problem. You know, even though people curse Jesus Christ, he's still willing to forgive them. You can, and, and you know, isn't it interesting that God and Jesus Christ are some of the favorite curse words in the American vocabulary? Isn't that interesting? They'll curse him up one side and they'll curse him down the other. And he still is willing to forgive them. But again, again, is this jailhouse religion? You know, now some people genuinely find the Lord, repent, and have a wonderful experience of conversion in the jailhouse. Thank God for them. Thank God for them. But not everyone does. And so we've come to know that as jailhouse religion. You know, oh, yeah, I'm so sorry. Oh, please help me get out of here. You know, that kind of thing. Is this jailhouse religion? Well, again, the Lord <clears throat> looks not on the profession. The Lord looks on the heart. And the Lord, in examining the heart, knows things that we can't know. Keep your finger in Second Samuel, but flip over to First Kings chapter 2. Now, <clears throat> keep in mind... David here, a type, not Jesus Christ, but a type or a picture of Jesus Christ. When the Lord returns, don't you think he'll know everything about everybody? You can hide nothing from him. So, <clears throat> David, in his dying words, is speaking to his son Solomon, who is about to ascend David's throne. And in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 8, he says, some of the last words he says to Solomon are, verse 8, And behold, thou hast with thee Shimei, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a Baharim, which cursed me with a grievous curse in the day that I went down to Maonaim. But he came down to meet me at Jordan. And I swear to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put thee to death with the sword. Okay, good. Now, therefore, hold him not guiltless, for thou art a wise man and knowest what thou oughtest to do unto him. But his hoar head bring thou down to the grave with blood. And David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Last thing David had to say was, I know that guy's a rat. You take care of me. And so Solomon did. Again, a wonderful example of the Lord just examining the heart. All right, <clears throat> let's go to Second Samuel chapter 19. We're about right on schedule, not bad here. Let's look at the third personality. And what we're doing is examining attitudes about the return of a king. Is the king going to return? 
Let me tell you something, and this may not resonate totally with everyone, but I think most of you will get it. Mankind builds theological systems. And one of the prevailing theological systems in the world today amongst so-called Christianity is what we call amillennialism. The teaching of all millennialism is that Jesus Christ is never going to physically, actively return to establish his kingdom. That mankind is going to initiate the kingdom. And mankind is going to initiate the kingdom through whatever church is propagating that all millennialism. The majority of so-called Christianity is all millennial in their theology. You know... We're going to just keep being nice and doing good, and someday we're going to bring in the kingdom. How's that working out? It doesn't seem to be working out real well at all, is it? Now, when you really, really get down to the nuts and bolts of that theological system, why would anyone prefer mankind to bring in a perfect kingdom as opposed to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to bring in the kingdom? It's because they don't like his rules. That's why. They don't like what he has said he is going to do when he establishes his kingdom. They prefer their own rules. Now, having said that, in uh, 2 Samuel in chapter 19 and verse 24, we're going to encounter the third personality and a third attitude about the coming of the king. And Mephibosheth, isn't that a great name? Now, that's a good name. I don't know why nobody ever named, I don't know why nobody names their kid Mephibosheth. You know. I mean, people name their kids other Bible names, James and John and Peter and Zachariah and now I ever tell you about the kid named Zachariah I met? I know I have, but you forget. I was preaching. We were uh, living, pastoring a church in Washington. And a buddy of mine who lived down south of us in Vancouver, who pastored a church, called me up. and We arranged a, a deer hunting trip. We were going to go to eastern Washington on a muzzle-loading deer hunting trip. So, okay, fine. So he said, well, can you come down Sunday afternoon? You have somebody that can preach for you and, and uh, preach for me Sunday night. And then immediately after the service, we'll take off. I said, okay. So I drove down there and threw all my gear in the truck. And, and I got there a little early. And there were just a couple cars in the parking lot. So I sat in my truck a little bit. And then I decided, well, I'll wander in and sit down. And so I wandered in, sat down. And there were just three or four people in there and and a couple of little kids, and this one kid came up to me, and he just started to talk, visit with me. Well, I like that, you know. I, so we were visiting a while. I said, uh, what's your name? He said, well, my name is Zachariah. I said, man, that's a good Bible name. Yes, I know. <laughs> I said, well, Zachariah, how old are you? He said, well, I'm 10. I said, okay. That's, I said, that's a pretty good age to be. I said, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, he didn't flinch. He said, I want to be a dentist. I thought, well, that's kind of unusual for a 10-year-old, you know. I mean, eh, most people don't make up their mind to be a dentist until they're halfway through college or something, you know. And I said, you want to be, and, you know, I thought, well, he'd say, well, I want to be a firefighter or a policeman or a, whatever, you know. But, I want to be a dentist. I said, why do you want to be a dentist? He said, because I want to hurt people. My thought was, they should have named you Abishai, <laughs> not Zachariah. So I said, well, Zachariah, why do you want to hurt people? He thought about it, and he says, yeah. Now, this is a 10-year-old. He said, I think it's because I got some German blood in me. <laughs> you got any German in you, Stu? No, negative. No, negative. Okay. <laughs> Oh, my. Now, Mephibosheth, that's a good name. He turns out to be a good guy. All right, 19, verse 24. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. 
And had neither dressed his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed unto the day he came again in peace. And it came to pass when he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, that the king said unto him, Wherefore wentest not thou with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceive me. For thy servant said, I will saddle me an ass that I may ride thereon and go to the king, because thy servant is lame. And he hath slandered thy servant unto my lord the king. But my lord the king is an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in thine eyes. For all of my father's house were but dead men before my lord the king. Yet didst thou set thy servant among them that did eat at thine own table. What right therefore have I yet to cry any more unto the king? And the king said unto him, Why speakest thou any more of the matter? I have said, Thou and Ziba divide the land. And Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take all, for as much as my lord the king is come again in peace into his own house. Now, let's get a little background on this fellow Mephibosheth. He was one of Saul's sons. Saul, the declared enemy of David, long before Absalom, you see. But <clears throat> in his youth, he fell. And as a result of the fall, he was crippled. And so he couldn't function very well, obviously. He was crippled in his legs. And uh, <clears throat> so David took great compassion and mercy on Mephibosheth, took him into his own household, fed him, clothed him, housed him, took care of him in every uh, possible kind of way. And so... When Mephibosheth came down to meet the king, the king asked an obvious question. He said, where you been? Why haven't I seen you? Mephibosheth said, well, he said, my servant deceived me. He was going to saddle an animal up for, uh, an animal up for me so that I could come and join you. But he deceived me and in his deception he was slandering you. He was cursing you. He said, so you can see... From the day that you left, I've been in mourning and grief. God, uh, David said, okay, Mephibosheth, I'll buy your story. I'll get into it. All right. He said, I'll tell you what, <clears throat> you and Ziba, your servant, you, you take all that land over there and, and that's yours. And I will continue to provide for you. Mephibosheth is a great story. I uh, I don't have time to elaborate very much on it, but I want to tell you very quickly. If you study Mephibosheth, you see a whole other set of types. Number one, he is lame because of a fall, 2 Samuel 4.4. 4. You know why Adam and Eve were lame spiritually? Because of a fall. The fall from grace, fall into sin, you see. And so Mephibosheth is a type of the sinner. Anything lame in Leviticus chapter 21 is unacceptable to God. You remember the Jews under the Levitical uh, statutes of offerings were, <coughs> excuse me, ordered to bring various kinds of uh, uh, sacrifices to the Lord. Nothing lame, nothing lame. It couldn't be blind. It couldn't be halt. It couldn't be lame. It couldn't have any kind of a blemish on it. If it was a lamb or a goat or a bullock or whatever it was, it had to be perfect in every detail. And so. Uh, God lays that out. And then he even translates that down to the priesthood. A man couldn't serve as a priest if he had any blemishes or lameness or anything like that. The whole idea is that it's unacceptable to God. Now, what is that? That's a picture of sin, you see. Sin is unacceptable to God. That's the that's what's being transmitted here. All right, now... <clears throat> Interestingly, we have a phrase in our colloquial language that we use a lot. Lame excuses. You ever heard that? How many of you have ever heard a lame excuse? Yeah, well, everybody has, of course. A lame excuse. You know, I, it, nobody hears more lame excuses than the preacher. <laughs> well, I've just been so busy. Yeah, I know. I'm getting mean in my old age. Next time something, don't even tell me that because I'm going to say next time you need a real serious prayer request, God's going to be too busy. You know, so 
<clears throat> Mephibosheth is lame. He's a picture of a broken down sinner. So what you need is a flawless priest to work in your behalf. The good news is the lame are invited to the king's table over in Leviticus or Luke chapter 14. Remember that? The Lord sent some emissaries out and he said, you invite some people to the king's wedding, the king's son's wedding. Well, one fellow said, I, I've got land I'm going to go buy. Another fellow said, I got this business to take care of. Another fellow said, well, I just married a wife. You know, I can't come. And so what did the Lord say? He said, all right, you go out and you gather the lame and the afflicted and you gather every broken down homeless bum that you can find and you bring them to the wedding. Now, again, what we have here is a picture of grace because spiritually we all are lame. Every single one of us, you see. And the Lord says, I'll tell you what, I'll take them under the auspices of grace. So Mephibosheth paints a, a, a wonderful picture. I wish I had more time to elaborate, but uh, I must uh, I must carry on here because I, I got... I still got pages to go here. All right, Mephibosheth. So his attempts to get to the king failed in verse 26. The servant lied to the king about his efforts. The servant lied to the king about his efforts. You know, the world is lying to you about the king returning. They poo-poo it. They make little of it. They try to disqualify it in every way, shape, or form. But the king is coming. Make no mistake about it. One day, one day he will be here. Let's examine fellow number four. Chapter 19 of Second Samuel, verse 31. I really like this guy. And Brazilii, the Giladite, came down from... Rajalim, and went over Jordan with the king to conduct him over Jordan. Now, Brazilii was a very aged man, even fourscore years old. And he had provided the king of substance while he lay at Menaenim, for he was a very great man. In other words, he was wealthy. He was loaded. And the king said unto Brazilii, Come thou over with me, and I will feed thee with me in Jerusalem. And Brazilii said unto the king, How long have I to live that I should go up with the king unto Jerusalem? I am this day fourscore years old. And can I discern between good and evil? Can thy servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear any more the voice of singing men and singing women? Wherefore then should thy servant be yet a burden unto my lord the king? Thy servant will go a little way over Jordan with the king, And why should the king recompense it me with such a reward? Let thy servant, I pray thee, turn back again, that I may die in mine own city and be buried by the grave of my father and my mother. But behold, thy servant Chimham, let him go over with my lord the king, and do to him what shall seem good unto thee. And the king answered, Chimham shall go over with me, and I will do to him that which shall seem good unto thee. And whatsoever thou shalt require of me, that will I do for thee. And all the people went over Jordan. And when the king was come over, the king kissed Brazilii and blessed him. And he returned into his own place. And the king went on to Gilgal. And Chimham went on with him. And all the people of Judah conducted the king. And also half the people of Israel. All right, so we have this old timer, Brazilii. You know what Brazilii did? <clears throat> While the king was in exile, Brazilii did everything that he possibly humanly could to provide for the needs of the king. He made sure that food and drink and supplies of every possible thing that he had access to were trafficked to the king. And consequently, Brazilii gets a great blessing from the king. The king says, why don't you come on up to Jerusalem with me and just live in my house? I'll make, I'll make even a greater man out of you. Brazilia says, you know what? That's okay. I'm an old guy. I'm, I'm going to die here pretty soon. And I just want to go back to my own city. But I have a servant here. I have a servant here. 
And you can do whatever you think is right by him in my stead. King says, okay, I'll take care of him real well. What's the picture? Here it is. The king is presently in exile. He came into his own and his own received him not. He's presently in exile. But there are those that want to do everything they can to aid the king. Now, what the king needs is not exactly what David needed, but what the king desires is aid and help where his real heart is. And the king's present heart is, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so the king says to all of the Brazilians in Warfano Community Bible Church, hey, isn't that great news about 36 people getting saved over there in one meeting in Cambodia? Amen. Isn't that terrific news? Mm-hmm. The, the, the king says, <clears throat> if you'll aid and abet my program while I'm in exile, I will reward thee when I return. It's in the text, folks. It's in the picture. It's in the type. I'm looking forward to some kind of reward. You say, well, you mean uh, the Lord's going to make you a rich man? I'm not worried about that. You know what I want to hear? I just want to hear one thing. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's all. That's all. Brazilia, and ultimately, Brazilia's sons benefit. His own family benefits. Keep your finger here. Go to First Kings again, chapter 2. First Kings, chapter 2. Aren't these great stories? I mean... This is a wonderful book. First Kings chapter 2 verse 7. Again, <clears throat> right through here, verse 10, David dies. So these are the last words of David to his son Solomon, who is about to send the throne. And Solomon's reign is a picture of the millennial kingdom. But verse 7, but show kindness unto the sons of Brazilii the Gileite, and let them be of those that eat at thy table. For so they came to me when I fled because of Absalom, thy brother. Man! It has a trickle-down effect. You doing everything that you can to aid and abet the heartbeat of the king has a trickle-down effect into your own family. Not bad. So we have Mephibosheth. We have Brazilii. We have Amasa. We have Shimei. And then there's one last character that we need to study. Don't be him. If you're going to be anybody, be Brazilii. Be him. Be him. But there's one last character that we need to, uh, we need to study. Uh, chapter 20. And verse 1. And there happened to be there a man of Belial whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri and Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no part in David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse, every man to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel went up from after David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah clave unto their king from Jordan even to Jerusalem, verse 6. And David said to Abishai, Now shall Sheba, the son of Bichri, do us more harm than did Absalom. Take thou thy Lord's servants and pursue after him, lest he get him fenced cities and escape us. And there went out after him Joab's men, the Cherethites, the Pelethites, and all the mighty men, and they went out of Jerusalem to pursue after Sheba, the son of Bichri. So, we got this thing going on, and in the immediate ensuing verses, we've already read about Joab taking care of Amasa. And then we get down to verse 15. And they came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Micaiah, and they cast up a bank against the city, and it stood in the trench, and all the people that were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. So this character, Sheba, 
who is trying to form in a whole nother rebellion against the king gathers a group of people together and they're ducking and dodging and they finally end up in this fin city. So Joab and the troops, David's troops now, show up and they're ready to batter down the walls of the city. And what happens? Man, this is exciting. This is intrigue. How many of you know what happened? Oh. Oh. All right, let's find out what happened. Let's find out what happened. This great stuff. Then cried a wise woman out of the city. There are wise women. Amen? Amen. There are wise women. Thank God for wise women. Thank God for them. Then cried a wise woman out of the city, Hear, hear, say I pray you unto Joab, come near hither that I may speak with thee. I, You know, I don't know where the men were. A bunch of weasels. <clears throat> but thank God there was one wise woman in the city. And when he was come near unto her, the woman said, Art thou Joab? And he answered, I am he. Then she said unto him, Hear the words of thine handmaid. And he answered, I do hear. Then she spake, saying, They were wont to speak in old times, saying, They shall surely ask counsel at Abel. And so they ended the matter. I am one of them that are peaceable and faithful in Israel. Thou seekest to destroy a city and a mother in Israel? Why wilt thou swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? And Joab answered and said, Far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. The matter is not so. But a man of Mount Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri by name, hath lifted up his hand against the king, even against David, delivered him only, and I will depart from the city. And the woman said unto Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown to thee over the wall. It's a tough woman. It wasn't a tough lady, amen? amen? Yeah, no kidding, boy. But she spoke in words of great wisdom to Joab. She said, why in the world would you destroy an entire city? And Joab not only had the heart for that, but the capability of it. He was a warrior of all warriors. This guy was one mean dude. But this woman's wisdom struck resonance in the heart of Joab. He said, okay, all right, I get it. I shouldn't be here to destroy a whole city. I'm just looking for one bad guy. The woman says, okay, I get that. Verse 22, then the woman went into all the people in her wisdom and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and cast it out to Joab. And he blew a trumpet and they retired from the city, every man to his tent, and Joab returned to Jerusalem under the king. <laughs> Wow. As many today, Sheba wanted nothing to do with the king. Nor is willing to recognize him as king. He said, neither have we an inheritance with him. Tragically, the majority of the world wants nothing to do with the king. Nothing to do whatsoever. And so there is a destiny for the nations that harbor that kind of sentiment. Go with me to Revelation 19, our last passage. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Now here we have a glossary, technicolor picture of the king's return. He's coming back. He is coming back. Oh, I don't believe that. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. You think God's impressed with what you believe or don't believe? It just doesn't matter. What matters is what he has said. And here's what he said concerning the not too distant future. Verse 11, and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. 
And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's you. That's you. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's a phrase that's been embraced and very popularized in Handel's Messiah. The tragedy of it is the majority of the people probably that have sung it don't believe it. They sing it, but they don't believe it. The king is coming. What's your attitude? I hope it's Brazilian. I hope it's that attitude. I want to do everything I can to aid and abet the king. He's in exile right now. It's a self-imposed exile. But he's coming back. What a day that will be. When my Jesus, I shall see. Let's stand for prayer.